Do I get to see your face or are we going to look at a, a screen capture? Okay, sorry, it wouldn't, it wouldn't let me enable my video and audio until I clicked the OK, I'm being recorded button. Oh, yeah, that's fair. You are being recorded, John. Oh, we got a glimpse at your background. Is that okay? It's okay. I'll see it again. There it is. <laughs> Just figured it could be, you know, distracting. Got a lot of stuff going on back there. Yeah, there's a license plate. Is that for an application to a race in the forest in Tennessee somewhere? No, it's not. That's just for my first car ever after <laughs> it was, was totaled. How, how, oh, after it was totaled. How old were you? What kind no, of car? No, was it? no fault of my own. And actually, my dad was driving it, and the guy just plowed into him at a, a stoplight. What kind of car? 93 Seafoam Green Ford Taurus. I actually also still keep a little piece of the bumper. <laughs> yeah, quite precious to me. That um, is fantastic. Matches my wall behind me there. It, it yeah, it what disappears in, in the yeah. it sure does. <laughs> that is uh that is wonderful. I still have something from all of my cars, whether it's the key or a license plate or a keychain from them. Uh I got to drive one of your your vehicles. You I think you said you drove it to prom, is that right? Oh yeah, my dad's dad's old uh 2002 explore sport track yeah took that to, to prom my senior year what year was that uh that would have been 2003 so it was a <sighs> it was a brand spanking new truck at that point in time she's a beaut i gotta tell you i enjoy driving that truck around got to drive it uh all the way back to the knoxville airport at uh, 3 a.m for my departure uh i'm i'm guessing your dad found it no problems uh it's back where it should be yeah it worked perfect i mean he just kind of drove me on my way home and we swung by the airport and he got it and I continued on. It's it's pretty much on, on my way back. So that gave me another half hour or so of uh, not having to focus on the road or anything. <laughs> and quality time with your pops. Of course. Let's start there. Um, I am incredibly thankful that you reached out and asked me if I would like to crew for you. Your timing was impeccable. It was, I don't remember exactly, I say four months, but that feels like maybe it was uh, in that vicinity. Um, and you assisted greatly in, in allowing me to come back to Tennessee and your family in particular really helped me out. I stayed at their house. Um, I camped with you. I got to use the vehicle. So first and foremost, thank you. And then secondly, Let's do, let's do that. Let's talk about family. So do you know, because I don't, it's pure speculation and guess, are you the only finisher in the history of the Mar Berkeley marathons with four kids? I have no idea. That's a great would, question. Would um, take some research, but I'm guessing um, no one has finished with more children. So um, we we can probably ask that question on on Twitter and someone will dig it up within 10 minutes. <clears throat> that yeah, undoubtedly that will be the case. Um how do you go about balancing everything out and your wife Jesse is just one of the loveliest people and maybe speak a little bit to the home life side of things. Yeah, she is. She has been absolutely incredible uh through all these years of of doing these things. You know, she did not marry an ultra runner uh, that that came well after the fact. Uh, and, you know, the first time I got into Barkley, it, it was kind of crazy because our, our youngest was a, a newborn, well, an, an infant at, at the time. And I didn't know what I was doing. And my training was all over the place and obsessive and I had spreadsheets of every little hill in the area Ooh, and you have spreadsheets. I could you know go do repeats on and it was it was inefficient and and time consuming and uh consumed my my focus and my energy as well and so if things were still like that with the four kids absolutely no possible way it would work it would like not even remotely a question uh but as more kids came uh as uh, other life commitments increased as kids started having uh baseball and dance and soccer and everything else uh my 
training got much more efficient, uh, in part thanks to my, my coach, David Roach, who could, takes care of all that, so I don't have to worry about planning it or analyzing it. Um, when I was still working in an office, all my weekday miles were my commute, so I was kind of getting that time for, for free instead of sitting in a car or on a train. Uh, and then it's just a, about adapting and being flexible and making them a part of the process. You know, if I have a long run, maybe I'll get up and I'll run to some destination where they can meet me and we can make a fun day of it. If there are Saturday baseball games, then I'm likely going to be doing a long run, running laps around the field, watching <laughs> the whole time. And has so, anyone you know, called the police on you yet? No, no, they, they have not. I am I am the police myself. You know, I envision that if, if anyone, <laughs> if any bad person comes into the scene there, then, I, then I'm on top of that. I've, You're uh, the first I've, person I've, that's going to recognize something out of the ordinary. That's right. And be able to run them down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's been, I, I mean, just having her support, my kids' support has, has been enormous and it's uh, definitely a, a bit of give and take on both sides and just also realizing things are never going to be optimal. Like I'm never going to get in quite the mileage or the cross training or the strength training or the vert that I want to be able to get in. I'm My mileage is comparable to a serious recreational marathon runner and that's that's what I make do with. So would you then say the differentiation for the limits that you have with getting physical training in would be the mental side of things for you? Um, well, I mean, that is one thing I love about races like Barkley. There's, there are a lot of variables. It's, it's a complex problem. And as an engineering oh, CD type person, I, I like that. It's, <laughs> it's fun. Um, so that's, that's definitely one area of it um and and outs you know i also think that the physical part it's well i maybe haven't been able to do the volume that i would like to or maybe i also have that to thank for being able to consistently do the volume that i've done over the past decade I, i've never had an extended period of time off of running but due, due to injury or anything else, you, you know, like I had a toe surgery in the fall. I, I took a week or two off. I fell did off you have a your lap. Not, did you have your toenails surgically removed? No, I had a bone spur on top of the uh, the big toe joint. And I went ahead and got that taken off care of before it became a bigger problem. Mostly because I fell off a ladder earlier in the year and blew through my deductible and out of pocket max and all of that on my insurance. So it was, it was I nice. really so oh. free, free medical, whatever I want to do. That, well, that's kind of standard. Most places in the world, is it not? Oh, wait, you're in free the United States medical. of America. Oh, yeah, okay. Free quick. That. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I can get free medical. I just got to sit there and wait for a while. You are correct. Uh, I hope everybody watching has seen the John Kelly ladder fall. Uh, if they haven't, John, where might they be able to find that footage? It might still be floating around on um, social media somewhere. I, I think I think after a while, I, I may have made it private, to, to be honest, because the people that seemed to be randomly seeing it um, a year later were uh, were people who weren't seeing it in the proper context and uh, was was not getting the, um, well, the meaning out of it that I, I originally hoped for, which was, hey. Don't be a careless idiot. Like I, I knew better than this. I still did it anyway. And this is what happens. Your message resonated and it got across. And truly, I owe you a thanks. And I think many others do too. It was a very visceral reminder of what not to do, even but while done by a very intelligent human being. So I go a little overboard with our Christmas decorations and that involves ladder work. And Linda makes sure to say, don't pull a John Kelly out here today. There you go. It, it was all worth it then. If it, and um, I'm thinking about the angles when I'm putting that thing up. I, I mean, long story short, yeah, I was I was going around and I was replacing some floodlights that were at different heights, and I got to one that was lower than the rest, and I was in a rush because I had to get to a kid's activity, and so didn't bother adjusting the height of the ladder or the length, 
which meant that I had to put it up at far too shallow of an angle. It's like 45 degrees instead of, you know, should be like this. And so as I climbed up it, the bottom fell out from under me and I, I pancake fell onto the asphalt from 20, 25 feet. And we're very fortunate that it wasn't magnitudes worse. Yeah, just uh, unbelievable. But all I did was bruise some ribs and uh, fracture my non-dominant wrist. And, you know, a simple non-displaced fracture. Incredible. Um, John, can you please list for me in alphabetical order the all of the news outlets that have reached out to you to discuss your historical third finish at the Barkley Marathons this year? Um. Well, there was a Canadian news channel. I, I don't remember uh, its name. They're doing Global a story. News. E Ehor. Uh, and then WBIR in, in Knoxville. <laughs> After your <laughs> yeah, first yeah. finish at the Barkley Marathons, were you not on ESPN? I was. I made it on Sports Center. That was a highlight. <laughs> I've got the, the clip there with, you know, me there and their little side frame saying, you know, LeBron James is coming up next. <laughs> after he waits on our lead story john kelly how far are you have fallen with the finishes clearly there's been a oh, burnout and, on seeing and and last year as well i you, you know just the podcasts and whatnot i had like three dozen or, or something um I, you know was I, there I, a I bigger get, story out of the barkley ha having the stretch of, of six years with no finish well it was it was funny i i did at the gate after the race, I, I was joking with Jasmine. I said, Th thank you. Now I won't have to do any podcasts. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I didn't realize how right I was. So, you know, I reached I, out to John I, and I, I had no expectations. And I, I, I um, am totally going to be fine if people have other obligations. And I wasn't sure. And then John responded and basically was like, thank God someone actually wants to hear a little bit of my story this year. <laughs> no, that's OK. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm yeah. same, same stuff third time i get i get the sense you are not uh not offended by that and having I, I, an appearance I doubt jared, jared probably hasn't talked to many people either no that's just it exactly old news old news um true or false each year early on the morning of november 1st john kelly sets a really early alarm and gets up and creeps through his own home to steal his children's candy for his fueling at his ultras. I wouldn't need to sneak to do that. You know, I, I just, just bigger than them. <laughs> they, they know the, they know the pecking order. All uh, right. So, but, as, but no, I, I will say, I will say after I do one of these things is, is one of my kids favorite time of year because then they get the candy the cupboard, back. The cupboard is filled with little Debbie cakes and white fudge covered. Oh, that's not showing up. There we go. My white co fudge covered pretzels that I'm I'm finishing off here. Yeah. So a lot of people thought I was there crewing Ehor, and uh, there was a social media clampdown while we were in the park, so we weren't technically allowed to comment on what was going on. Some people did anyways. I wanted to respect that to the best of my abilities, so I couldn't even comment to say that I was actually there crewing John. Um, and these are the this is the four pages of spreadsheets that John provided to me for his. Crewing, to make sure I got the crewing correct. You you and, didn't even mark off the checklist. Oh well, well, I got. How did you make I, it I, This is who I am. Yeah, I am. I'm back here. I got my actual okay. notes there and there. Okay. So, yeah, there but go. this is my favorite part. So these, so John has total calories per lap, which is great. And then it is so loop one. It goes twenty five hundred, three thousand, thirty five hundred, four thousand, thirty five hundred. Those are the calorie totals for each loop that John's out on course. And the breakdown is, it's 50% tailwind, 50%, is it Morton? Is that how you say it, Morton? Yeah, 25%, yeah. Or sorry, 25%. I know the brand. I, 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 ne I never can remember how to say it. I still don't Okay, know. I wanted to get it. So 50% tailwind, 25% Morton, and 25% Halloween candy. So John has a bin of all of the candies you can get at 7-Eleven or Dollar General or your neighborhood gas station. And there's about 20 different options in there. And then I, this was kind of fun for me, actually, where it was like, okay, I get to randomly choose and pick how I'm going to fill in the other 25% of John's calories with pure sugar. Um, no, no, you... no, no. There's, there's only one of those color-coded categories. 
is the pure sugar food group. Right. Sorry. So there's there's non-solid, soft and chewy, pure pure sugar, savory, chocolate, and crunchy. This reminds me of the elf. Those are, the, those are your primary food groups. The elf list of food groups from Will Ferrell in the movie Elf. Sugar, syrup. What were the other lists? This is what John's list is. It clearly and works. Candy, candy corn. Yeah. Candy. <laughs> it works. Um, you have a sweet tooth. Would that be fair? Yeah, a little bit. Do you, My dad has do one. you satiate that sweet tooth on a day-to-day -day basis? Or is this where you save up for your races and then get all of your sweet tooth satisfaction while you're out there? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm definitely not overindulging on a daily basis, but I'm also not restricting myself if, if I do. Your, your physique would suggest you are not overindulgent. Well, I, yeah, I mean, if I get a big craving for something, I'm going to, I have a year round supply of um, Little Debbie Christmas tree cakes in my freezer. So that if at any point in time I get a craving for Little Debbie Christmas tree cake, it's there. You, you gotta, you gotta treat, treat yourself. Um, Ehor, who I just spoke with, I asked him if he had a question for John Kelly, and his question was, "How did John enjoy his Goo Goo clusters, and did those work out for him?" Those were great. I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to to make sure I, I get more of those. They're they're tough to come by. Um, you know, they're they're another like Little Debbie, a, a Tennessee item, um, but not as widespread. You you can get them at Cracker Barrel mostly is the easiest place to find them. Um, but, you know, I think I described them to you as a turtle plus a marshmallow layer. And they, and they, they were really... gluten-free. Yeah. So uh, the Goo Goo Cluster and Snickers, uh, oatmeal cream pies, and nutty bars. Those those were kind of my big four, I think. Uh, you know, there are all those other side options, but but those are the big ones. And they all kind of hit that. They get above that magic threshold of 400 calories per 100 grams. That's that's when you're getting some good calorie density. Um, nutty bars are up there at like 550. They're just, they're out of this world. And I mean, also truly the cost per item is about a 10th of what you're gonna spend if it's branded as run racing fuel. That's true. I, I'd probably get a whole box of Little Debbie cakes for the same, same cost as one Morton gel. <laughs> I did put out on Twitter, uh, people could ask a few questions, and this one ties in nicely. So Joe Fireball uh, asked John if he keeps a donut spreadsheet, you know, best, worst by state and country. No, I haven't done that. Um, I do have a list of my favorite desserts, um, homemade, store-bought, fast food. You, you know, I've, I've broken that down, but I, no, I don't have a donut-specific one. All right, um, let's get back to the the Barkley Marathons itself. So this was your third finish. Um, you have you grew up right around the corner from the park. Um, this finish in particular, how did it differ from the previous two? Other was... other than I mean, I'll start for you. Other than having like the best crew person you've ever had, I mean that's a given. But <laughs> other than that, how was this different? Um, that's, that's tough. Um, you know, I feel like the first one really just completely mentally broke me, you know, that finish, I was, I was Both out, I, I didn't know where I was. I was running to the gate because I was worried if I stopped, I'd fall asleep. Um, so that that was, and you know, we had bad conditions uh, that year. Um, we sure did. <laughs> bad, bad conditions on loop five and at the start. I, I actually, I made a, I went back and made a list of all the, the mistakes that we made this year and, and shared with Damien and Ehor. And I, I estimate they, add, it was a bunch of small mistakes. Um, yeah, it seemed like I didn't hear about any huge critical mistakes, but. Yeah, so there, four, there, the were, was there were two that I would kind of call moderate but there was never disaster i was never lost like that's the key there were times when i knew that i wasn't where i wanted to be but i knew where i was 
and could fix it. And, and that's a huge thing at Barkley. And so all of those little mistakes, I, I added them up and it was like, yeah, probably cost us about an hour total. You and I lost more than that before we got to garden Cool. stop. On They won. yeah, yeah, we had a genuinely unique Barkley experience together for all of the obvious reasons, but um, you know, proud to say that you got to finish that year in one of the worst weather conditions that a finisher has been up against, and our ability. It's our time. And the start time and the the amount of darkness and really what I look back on is one of the most proud things from 17 when we when we were um, kind of paired up for the first four laps was we knew after one that if we didn't get our shit together, we were out after two. And we managed to absolutely nail the second lap and peel back all of the time that we gave away on the on the first lap to give ourselves a chance to eventually get you to the finish line and and get me there in a roundabout manner as well. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, again, I, I still tell people, I, I think you have one of the the all time great Barkley performances, whether it you know officially counts as a finish or, or not. I got So. through the course. I got all the pages. I did not finish. I will never pretend that I did. Um, but yeah, I, you know, something I've been saying from this experience now is um, this was my last trip to Frozen Head and this was my farewell tour. I wanted to say bye to all the people involved and thank them for everything. And this was an incredible experience on my end to get to see three of my very good friends, Ehor, John and Jared finish. Congrats to Greg Hamilton as well, who I didn't know and don't know. Um, and then to see the first ever female finisher. I mean, that is the icing on the cake. I, as an individual, feel like, I'm sure you do too, that I've extracted more experiences and value from that park than almost anybody has a right to. Um, what was it like for you this year on the first lap when you were working in such a large group? Yeah, I mean, you can go with what you want to say there, but that'll be the question. Yeah, well, real quick, just to, to step back to the, the last question you asked that I didn't fully answer the difference between the three, just thinking about it as we talk here, I think the first one was me just getting a finish. The second one was me enjoying a finish where, you know, I really savored that last loop. I, I, I took my time. I watched the sunset over my family farm. Chimney top was just... <laughs> Very few people, picturesque yeah. and amazing so there's there's finishing there's enjoying the finish and then this year was more just like enjoying other people's finishes and, and being out there I, I to be honest i don't know that i was really thinking all that much about a finish it was more just like i'm out here and i'm having fun and we're doing this and i'm gonna keep going and then eventually oh that was five loops We're we're done. So it was it was just Well, there wasn't yeah, a lot of alone different time this focus. year. Yeah, no, well just just loop five and not even fully loop five. And we did, it was the first time ever that we could have worked together on loop five. If people had chosen to do that, we we did not. I don't think anyone did. Um I don't know. You know, I, I guess you're not really supposed to on loop five, but also I kind of enjoy my loop five alone time. Uh, It's the ultimate Greg test and at the end I, of the race. yeah, and, and it's just this this magical feeling being out Mm there Interestingly, there were reports from the course on five um, and even a little bit on four about how rough you looked. 
and your family were concerned in hearing these reports. I, I know this is where I'm getting, this is where I'm going, John. Your family were concerned with these reports as though it was something abnormal. And then when I finally got a chance to talk to them, they said, you know, how is John doing? I'm like, he's doing amazing. And they're like, oh, it sounds like he's going through a rough patch. I'm like, listen, it's all subjective as to where he is in the race at this point. He looks like absolute shit, but I know where he's actually at and he's doing incredibly well. I personally never had a moment on the sidelines where I doubted that you would finish this year just based on what I was seeing and how things were going. You mentioned just then being asked by Greg, did you at any point during your 59 plus hours have a moment where you questioned if it was going to happen this year? No. It seemed, I, it really seemed I, like I had, clockwork. At the end of loop four, I had a few moments where I questioned myself, like, why are you doing this? Do you really want to go back out there again and do a whole nother loop? And, you know, that was just momentary. Um, but it, it, the thought occurred. Um, it was, it was quickly pushed aside. It, really the only time that like, I was not feeling good was, was those times where I just, I get that uncontrollable urge to sleep come on me. And, and, you know, that seemed like it's not something that Ehor gets. Um, he does not. <laughs> I just, it, and it, it started with me on the the third loop going up chimney top at, at night where we have that long trail and the, the trail just lulls me to sleep. You know, I'm not having to focus on navigation. I'm not blasting down a descent. It's just this long, tedious, gradual uphill on an actual trail. And it lulls me to sleep every time. It's and one so of the I, few places in the Barkley where you can shut your mind off and just go through the motions. And that point in the race, I am the same. The The sleep starts to overwhelm me, the need for sleep. And, and so I, like, I, I would be fine with it if I just got drowsy or fatigued or I was seeing purple unicorns or something. But I, <laughs> I just cannot keep my eyes open. It is the only relatable other thing that I've, I've had like it is, is when I've had to have something like toe surgery and go under general anesthesia. And yeah. it's, it's that like overwhelming sense of, I know this is coming. I know I'm about to go to it's, sleep and there is nothing I can do. Like it's that feeling of no control. And so that's where I kind of say to myself, the one thing that I can control is when and where it happens. So I'm going to lie down right there and, it, you know, on that fifth loop going up chimney top again, uh, I did that twice for five minutes each. And, and then again, uh, about halfway through the loop, just before uh, Ehor and I crossed paths for about 10 minutes. And it's, it's just long enough to kind of tell my body, okay, fine, like, fine, you're going to do this, do it now, get it over with, and then we're moving. So finally coming down chimney top, I forget which year and lap it was for me later in the race four or five, a couple of years ago, I had to stop and pee real quick. So I just dropped my poles, went to the bushes, came back out. And when I went to pick up my poles, I was so confused and out of it. I couldn't remember which way I was supposed to go on chimney top trail. And it wasn't an up or down. It was kind of a flat stretch. And I yep. just thought, okay, I think this is the way I'm going. I'm going to have to get into this. And as long as it continues to go down, I know it'll be right. But I decided then and there that any time I was going to stop late in the race, I would have to take my poles and point them in the direction that I was to go. So I had a reference because that's how quick and easy your mind can lose the, the script while you're out there. Now, yeah. after the fourth lap, you were the only person in the race this year that actually got to lay down. Um, you took a 20 minute nap down at the campsite and seemed like it was a real quality sleep. I want to give a shout out to Brian Ralph, who is Kelly Halpin's significant other. We were sharing a campsite, great guy, and he assisted a little bit there with just getting some hot food in your mouth. So we got you a couple of grilled cheeses and some broth. And you drank the broth, you got the food in, which was great. You were groggy, but it was obvious that you weren't uh, questioning going out on five. But a funny thing that happened is 
is that uh, you? I asked you if you wanted more broth, and your response was, uh, and I turned to Brian and I said, that's a yes, because you didn't say no. And Brian said, I didn't know you spoke strung out hillbilly. <laughs> 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 so we were still having fun on the sidelines, but yeah, once we got you up and going onto, onto five, it was obvious that you were going through the motions and you were going to, to get it done. Um, how was and, it intersecting? Or, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, that, that nap was, was great. I, I do kind of wonder how much it really helped given that I, I laid down for five minutes, two more times on the way up chimney top. Um, but I, I do think it was it was good, and it was kind of one of those things where maybe I don't need to, but I can, so I'm going to. Like, I, I had that time buffer this year, a bit bigger time buffer than I've ever had after four loops, and, and so I said, I'm, I might as well go ahead and do this. I also, uh, last year, I wanted to get out first on, on clockwise, and so I skipped the, the nap in camp this year. Um, I, I kind of didn't want to, to to be honest i mean we we had discussed preferred directions i, I wanted to give uh ehor and, and damien uh their opportunity to to go the way that they wanted I, I knew ehor needed to work on his feet so i said well i've got this time i might as well make good use of it um that was the first time i think i'd ever gone back to my campsite um during the race since 2017 when we napped after loop two and it's it, you know it was not only that i wanted them to be able to have their direction i kind of wanted counterclockwise as as well just as i finished twice going clockwise so you know it's uh i, I feel like I, I needed to do the the counterclockwise to, to kind of uh, have have the the full completion in both directions there so we have about seven and a half minutes left um, and a couple of things that right there. I mean, just seeing the camaraderie and the support from yourself and Jared to do whatever possible to assist people with uh, ha having their best chance at finishing. Um, people often ask, so what is kind of succinctly what what makes clockwise a little bit easier than counterclockwise? It's two main things for me, especially starting the loop at night. Um, the southern section that you start out on going counterclockwise is always tricky to navigate for me. You go down chimney top on a descent where it is really easy to miss the right spot at the bottom and to overshoot it, especially in the dark. And then going up from there is one of the few ascents that I struggle with a bit on, on navigation. In uh, my first running in 2016 with Jared, that's where my race ended, was going up from there was where I got turned around for over an hour and a half. Yeah, and I've, I've done it multiple times. And I, so so you're you're supposed to head kind of north east towards, um, towards Indian Knob. And multiple times I've had it headed too far directly east, which actually, funnily enough, puts you on Kelly Mountain. I've, I've been there a few times in the race, and so I at least avoided that. But it's odd because that southern section is the one part of the race that has not changed at all in all the years that I've done it. Yet I still, going <laughs> counterclockwise, especially in the dark, I mess it up. And then you get up to Indian Knob and going down from the prison, you kind of have to traverse a few spurs before you head down. And I, I just, I can't get it through, especially when you're in that sweep deprived state. I head down one spur too soon and then you're yeah. screwed. And I've it, been it, down it, one of those spurs and it was like a waterfall kind of rock face that I had to scurry down. And I thought yeah. if I slip and fall here, no one's ever going to find me. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's those three parts that are, it's rough to start off with those. It's rough to do it in the dark. And I, I was sitting there knowing like, great, like the timing's perfect to where I can't avoid having these in the dark. And I did, I messed up each of them a little bit, but not disastrously. And that was kind of the key for me going into loop five was, you, you know, just no disasters, just remain calm, take your time, no disasters and, and you're okay. 
And then the, the other piece that makes counterclockwise a bit more difficult is, is meat grinder, um, which, which is... you said at the finish was the hardest 40 minutes of your life. I wanted you to talk about it. Let's hear it. It is so it is the next to last. If you're going counterclockwise, it's the next to last one. Um, and wait, yeah, yeah, next to last. And so I had it in full afternoon sun. It was, we'll just say, much warmer uh, than I would prefer. The wind on the ridge was completely still, and you're just going up this narrow little spur that is incredibly steep, covered in rocks and vines and all sorts of things you're you're having to get through, and it just never ends. It doesn't you end. You said your there legs totally number, shut down on you there. Yeah, there, there are a number of milestones going up. You know, you cross... You hit the park boundary, you cross the north boundary trail, you cross the Bird Mountain Trail, and each time you're like, oh, great, I'm, I'm making progress, I'm almost there, and, and no, you're you're not. <laughs> just, but I, it, it, because starting that climb, I was like, okay, yeah, I can put in a good, solid effort, I'm still feel, physically feeling good, um, I can close this out strong and finish like an hour and a half, two hours to spare. By the time I got to the top of that, I was cooked and I, I had to sit down for like 10 minutes um, there in the breeze on the top before continuing. It was about but half. But you knew at that point that time was in the bank, right? You came in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like you, and you I, had the time you know, to do that. And I was the done was with, done. with any tricky sections. It was just yeah. a matter of, of getting there. And so, you, you know, 10 minutes sitting about half an hour before my legs felt usable again and my stomach and my head really never did recover from that climb i was kind of woozy and, and out of it a bit you uh, are consistent that. with one thing when you finish the barkley you look the worst of anybody that's coming across the finish line and your children were asking me why ehor looked so much better than daddy at the finish line which was really funny um we have two and a half minutes left this is going to well, cut off right there well, I, I will say one of the photographers told me that I'm like an ultra runner's photographer's dream because I, I wear exactly how I'm feeling uh, on on my face. You know, there there is no smiling for the camera or, or covering it up for me. Yeah, that is 100 percent true. And that's how you need to learn who John Kelly is to be able to interpret how he's actually feeling. Two minutes exactly. This is going to end right there. Um, let's talk about Jasmine Paris for the last couple of minutes. You've been a big part of her experience at the park over the last couple of years. Just um, thoughts on how everything went down this year. Oh, it was incredible. Just the way that she kept fighting back from spots that uh, it, it it seemed she wouldn't make it back from. You know, she, she slipped back from us at the end of Route 1. Uh, a little bit at the end of Loop 3. She, she kept fighting back. She she kept doing the impossible. When I saw her on loop five, it, it seemed like uh, she was too far back to be able to finish in time. And everyone at the finish had pretty much just accepted, hey, she's not going to be here in time. How late is she going to be? And, and there, I there believed she, that she, she was going to make it when I heard her tower time because I knew exactly where she was and what she was processing. But it was way too close for comfort. And, and she, you know, she is, she's an incredible athlete and she is an incredible person and just so incredibly deserved and, and glad that it's her. Uh, you, you know, one, one of my earliest, uh, I was happy to, to help it, it, Ehor, Jasmine, whoever, as, as much as I could here. One of my earliest experiences with her, she, her, she was supporting me on one of my Penain Way Runs. And a bog sucked my shoe off and we couldn't get the laces undone to uh, put it back on my foot. And she's without hesitating. She grabs it from my hand, but this bog encrusted shoe undoes the laces with her teeth <laughs> and hands it back to me. And we continue on. And I'm like, what has happened? So, I mean, she she's is like, uh, move aside, American. Is, this is how we do things in this part of the world. She is incredibly supportive herself as well. I was just so happy to be a part of that. Uh, John, thanks for freeing up the time. Really appreciate connecting with you. So super proud of what you were able to accomplish. And thanks for allowing me to be a part of it this year. Of course. Thank you so much.